So I'd like to introduce the Visiting Artist, Scholar, and Designer program. The program, the VASD program as I like to call it, is an interdisciplinary initiative that fosters vision, creativity, and innovation by bringing leading artists, scholars, and designers to campus. Providing direct access to contemporary culture, the program creates a cross-disciplinary environment made possible through appreciation and critical inquiry. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Gretchen Marie Schaefer, who's the program coordinator, who will introduce our 21st guest and our distinguished uh, lecturer this evening. Gretchen? Good evening. And thank you for joining us tonight for the third installment of our lecture series, Interventions. As we have explored in two previous lectures, this series investigates the various ways interventions function in art and design discourse today, offering moments for reflection and opportunities for change. We continue the series with tonight's lecture, The Architecture of Installations by Nader Tarani, an architect based in Boston. Nader received a Master of Architecture in Urban Design from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And he currently teaches and is head of the Department of Architecture at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is also principal and founder of the Boston-based architecture and design firm, NADA, which was recently named the number one architecture firm for design in the United States by Architect Magazine. Nader's work has been exhibited at the MoMA, LA MOCA, and ICA Boston, and has received an impressive list of accolades, including the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Architecture, the United States Artist Fellowship in Architecture and Design, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Architecture, among many others. Nader's lauded knowledge and exploration of space and materials even extends to his suitcase packing ability. In a single carry-on suitcase, he has included everything he will need during 10 days of travel, starting from the winter storms of Boston, to the sunshine of LA, to the dramatically shifting weather we have here in Denver, and then on to the blistering summer heat in Melbourne, Australia. Tonight, Nader's lecture will present investigations of materials, implications and consequences of the joining point, and the relationship between the part to the whole, all of which are concepts common in current architecture discourse, but also extend to the discussions and other creative fields. And now, I would like you all to join me in welcoming Nader Tarani. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight, and um, we've had a very nice session with uh, students, a small 24-hour charrette. And in many ways, uh, uh, the talk tonight is dedicated to the very collaboration we had with them. Uh, in a career that was intended to be an architectural practice, uh, we launched it uh, in an indirect way. Uh, having landed here from Iran uh, without a, a direct uh, cultural foundation, uh, patronage, uh, money, or clients, we realized uh, in the context of our education here, uh, at that moment in the early 80s, split between two paradigms, one of postmodernism that was looking at and ex the expanded field of history as the repertoire from which uh, culture could be gauged on the one hand and a kind of the emergence of uh, philosophy, literary criticism, and deconstruction as a kind of conceptual dismantling of the institution of architecture on the other. Uh, both of these movements had a huge impact on, on our education and yet Coincidentally, neither of them dealt with the problem of building in architecture. Now, 
clearly there is a difference between building and architecture. Uh, but at the same time, once architecture is robbed of its main agency, uh, its medium, its techniques, and what grounds it in, in a kind of uh, political possibility, uh, in, our, uh, in our minds it seemed all of a sudden impotent. So the way that we launched our practice was really to theorize building and to begin to establish a new relationship between uh, practice and pedagogy. And these works really are uh, an instrument, a way into that uh, kind of study. Why? Because effectively they're all small. They're installations, they're self-funded, sometimes they're funded by the outside, but they're not architecture, they're proto-architectural. They are the thing that awaits uh, another architecture to occur and a kind of mock-up. Um, their speculations, their tests, their experiments, they are a way of imagining that our commitment to teaching today is precisely not to prepare students to be ready for practice, because the practice that we thought of 20 years ago went into obsolescence about 15 years ago, and this is a kind of recurring cycle that happens almost all the time. So maybe the best that we can do right now is to uh, prepare students for uh, thinking, for strategies, and for innovation, for experimentation, and the comfort of, of uncertainty uh, to be able to experiment and fail, and in that process potentially uh, produce new forms of knowledge. We were lucky. Uh, in our early years, we uh, won a couple of awards, what are called the Progressive Architecture War Awards. They still exist to this day, but um, they don't have the same cachet. Uh, and we were discovered. Um, one day I was sitting next to the phone, and this fellow called Terry Riley called me, who was the architectural curator of, of MoMA at the time. And he said, you know, I'm calling you uh, to see if you're interested. He asked the question, if you're interested, to be part of the show. And I naturally thought it was a prank from one of our friends. I said, yeah, right. Uh, but it turned out to be true. And uh, in fact, the, the show Fabrications was dedicated to what he thought was an exploration of materials, precisely what was lacking in architectural studies at that time. And he didn't want to show any drawings. He didn't want to show anything that we usually do as architects, representations, uh, models. He wanted an actual fragment of architecture. And for that, we realized that this is a real opportunity to do two things, work in a medium in an unconventional way, uh, but also to tap into certain the emergence of digital media that simply at that moment in time uh, was not in the mode of uh, fabrication and construction. So we were working with steel, not working with found parts such as I-beams, channels, and angles, but uh, with a process of folding, like origami, to give it uh, structural stability, and uh, developed a system out of it. Uh, the system produced different panels of different shapes, almost over 50 of them. They all seem mass, they are all mass customized, but in fact their connection and their seams are absolutely identical. Um, and through the fold, giving them uh, structural stability, but also as the folds unwind, we um, expanded uh, the, the, the numbers of perforations so that the actual steel would uh, be lighter. Uh, in that process, of course, the working drawings, what we usually call plans and sections, really made no sense because any given plan at any uh, elevation would be a different plan. Nobody could, f could build from them. So the working drawings of this new paradigm are effectively a flattened pattern. Those of you who make uh, dresses may know of a pattern. And then the process starts with um, uh, the folding procedures. We also had to invent a new detail for it. Uh, of course, the, the detail is something that exists out there. Uh, when you buy a uh, McDonald's and you buy it uh, out of a box, 
that seam that is scored into the cardboard and folded um, uh, enables the exactitude of, of the fold. But the thicker the material, as you go from paper to cardboard to steel, uh, the offset of that cut, the score, the digital score, uh, begins to expand. And, and, and this is what's, what's called the stitched seam. Essentially what it does is it enables the fold, uh, but at the same time produces the continuity of steel as it slaloms down uh, the folded structure. Now, what was important for us, and I'll try to do this uh, back and forth the entire lecture, is how do you begin to establish some r rapport, some dialogue between what we're experimenting with uh, at a pure proto-architectural scale with the buildings that we're involving. And I, I, don't, I don't want to belabor the point. I could almost be silent with uh, some of the architectural explorations, but suffice it to say that the McAllen apartment building uh, involved a folded facade, a folded metal facade that was wrapping the staggered truss system that was the supports for the building, objectifying them in a kind of running bond pattern up the building, uh, and also giving a kind of localized structural stability to the very aluminum panels uh, on the walls. So uh, trying to develop uh, out of folding uh, different techniques that were used uh, in, in the MoMA installation. Now, what's most important about the MoMA installation was uh, a technique that had absolutely nothing to do with uh, fabrication. Uh, and it was the notion, and this is a question from Terry Riley, how do you begin to reference construction culture as opposed to architectural culture in this installation? And then he says, how do you know when something is true? or when something is right, or when something is level, or plumb. And we said, well, you know, when you hang uh, a string, you know that gravity gets it absolutely plumb. Or when you have a, um, a level, and when the bubble uh, aligns with the, the parallel lines, you know exactly that it's level. And so we developed essentially what was a grid. And as you know, in elevation, just like a Mondrian, just like a Rothko, we developed a vantage point from which our installation, which is highly customized, highly spatial, and formally complex, would appear absolutely flat as a kind of um, inverted perspectival ruse. All of the panels that you see here appear to be absolutely the same size, the same geometry, but of course by now, you know that this is a treacherous surface on which to walk. Um, but this anamorphic ruse was a central part of establishing also a, a, a relationship between some fundamental differences between uh, architecture and painting. Uh, this is a bleacher system that is looking back at the institution of art, uh, reflecting on a kind of uh, scenario of modernism and mass production through uh, uh, digital techniques that um, uh, begin to establish absolute perfection with the minimal tolerances. Of course, you know, the presence of the bleacher is a kind of urban phenomena. Uh, we've used it, we've seen it uh, adopted in Rome in the Piazza di Spagna, we've seen it uh, uh, at the entry of the, of the Met, but here uh, in the library for RISD, uh, it is a, a bleacher system that becomes kind of casual seating for the students um, and uh, a place of theater and a transformation of the library into a completely different setting. Here, in the context of the unfolding of the MoMA piece, the maximum perforation that, that actually shows the expansion by, um, by, by the second phase of MoMA, I, I suppose you've all read the brouhaha over the, the latest expansion that's about to happen. But also recognizing that uh, the constructive elements of perforation uh, are not just about structure and lightness. They're also about um, uh, the symbolic effects that they have. In this case, in the uh, um, uh, symphony hall in Antwerp, 
that occurs in the center of the zoo, uh, the development of a kind of rasterized image of various of the creatures uh, just next door uh, as they become an alibi for the acoustic tuning of the symphony hall. In other words, precisely because you don't want a smooth surface, the breaking up of that surface uh, acquires a different kind of um, register in the uh, development of the interior faces. Obviously then, the folding that is occurring uh, in the MoMA piece acquires a completely other dimension uh, and systemic use in other architectural projects. Uh, in this case, curiously, we were called by this company called BP that we thought w uh, stood for British Petroleum, but we later learned was a company undergoing a kind of uh, ethical transformation to beyond petroleum. This is all before the Gulf, by the way. Uh, and they wanted to do a, a green gas station. Uh, well, what is a green gas station? Even I can't tell you. <laughs> I can tell you it's lead uh, accredited and so forth, but I can tell you we used uh, 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 recycled stainless steel, but I still don't know what that means. <laughs> it has a green roof, but still. But effectively, what was interesting about uh, what they were pr uh, proposing was to challenge what is a gas station. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, begin to develop a system for that gas station that uh, is without a sign. They wanted an environmental condition, looking at the symbol of the Helios, uh, not as a sign, uh, but as a way of spatializing the entire uh, gas station. So effectively, the tessellation of the Helios became a mecha mechanism by which we could begin to construct the structure and the pylons and the pay station uh, uh, of the entire space uh, uh, of the station even incorporating the lighting, the sprinkler systems, and all of that as a mechanism to uh, fulfill the entire environment. Um, going outside then of our normative and received techniques is a central part of what we do, and in effect arguably need to do if we want to begin to uh, sort of understand and rediscover architecture. Uh, those of you who have grown up with, you know, the sartorial trade uh, probably understood this long time before I did, but for me, all of this was new some years ago. Uh, looking at the way in which clothing was made through pleating and darting uh, was a great discovery because we, I realized that through the simple cutting or excavation of a sheet material uh, and its, its pinning together of those joints, one has the ability to begin to make form, uh, to make space, to make perforation. With, that, with its interaction with uh, material, on the grain of the wood, it has a certain performance, and against the grain of, uh, of wood, uh, yet a secondary performance. So the, the idea that um, through a technique and through material agency, a new kind of architectural condition may emerge. Uh, because of that, we were able, for this installation at Harvard, called Immaterial Ultramaterial, is to develop a bowstring truss above the information station at the entry, using the wood effectively as a bottom cord of the space frame, suspended uh, over the booth, and then wrapping as an arch to connect the auditorium and the library left and right, and then wrapping against the column on the other end. Uh, the argument is e e effectively an extension of uh, the argument of mass customization, but in this case, uh, using the technique of the dart as an instrument to shrink wrap, to uh, accommodate the architectural contingencies around it. Um, the connection between each uh, sheet of wood uh, occurs with tabs on a rotational symmetry around the compressive struts that penetrate the void uh, 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 that binds them together and then pinned and screwed together on those intersections, producing a, a very 
sensuous uh, uh, geometry that would appear random but is in fact uh, completely calculated uh, in relationship to the necessities, if you like, of passage and code uh, uh, within the context uh, of that space. Now, this occurred, in fact, at the very same time that we got a real commission, uh, a commission to do a uh, pizza shop in uh, Beacon Hill in Boston, and uh, the budget of the store was about twenty twenty five thousand dollars and the commission was for five thousand uh, dollars so effectively we realized what well, there's no, not going to be a contractor on this project and uh, we're going to have to invent uh, the system and es essentially uh, install it ourselves and so the, the simple uh, the, the technique was quite simple we were thinking and looking uh, at you know the big uh, pizza ovens and many of these ovens have the kind of quilted sides, much like diners that you've seen. And we were wondering, well, what does it mean to take sheet material, give it structural stability through that folding process, much like the MoMA project, but then use them as shingles, pinning uh, them on three sides and letting the, th the fourth corner flap effectively uh, for tolerance. Uh, uh, in the context of an existing space that had uh, mechanical si uh, systems, lighting, uh, diffusers, and all of that uh, overhead, uh, we developed uh, this shingle system to, with fissures in it, with seams in it, such that the, the services could uh, become embedded within the existing framework of, uh, of those services uh, and, uh, and become a huge backdrop, a kind of theatrical backdrop uh, uh, against the vitrine, bringing the action of the spinning of the pizza uh, into the drama of the street. Um, and in a way, it was a kind of translation of some of the speculative work we were doing at Harvard into a real uh, commission uh, with a function and the ability to even pass code and uh, uh, get permitting done and so forth. Our commitment to uh, detailing then is is a is a considered one. Um, looking at historic techniques of of plywood, of of bending, and of self-similar operations as a way of getting outside of the industry to solve problems. In this case, the unfolding of plywood uh, panels in a staircase to become the support uh, uh, of a railing. Uh, in this case, a shelving system that does not have the traditional back to it to give it lateral stability, but using the bending of plywood to create depth in the corner, to create a moment connection such that you can put books uh, on the shelving uh, in both directions. Um, that translated again now to um, the lobby of the Antwerp Symphony Hall where plywood begins to take on a more figurative role at the monumental or civic scale. All of these are ways in which we have transitioned up and down from the scale of the installation down to a piece of furniture uh, or a detail on, on the one end or to the space of architecture uh, at the bona fide level. Um, this project, uh, though in plywood, uh, is not really a wood project. It's a masonry project. Uh, and it was really, I would say, uh, our first architectural commission and, more importantly, our first battle with uh, a calcified uh, American construction industry. We were given a commission to... Uh, renovate a space in downtown Boston for $260,000. Uh, a beautiful bank, actually. Uh, and uh, it was going to be transformed into a kind of fusion Asian Indian uh, restaurant, kind of a hip place. And they wanted us to build a very special structure in there, which is a lounge for drinking and, and smoking, the hookah bar. And uh, the problem was 
that once we designed it, a very organic and seductive form, the price came back for the hookah den alone at $200,000, which left the rest of the restaurant to be built for fifty or $60,000, and implausible. We were very innocent at that time and really didn't understand what the term means and methods meant. We had no understanding of that. We, these are not things that we learned at RISD or any other place. But as we began to understand the way in which, um, uh, let's say, the legal protocols occur between client, uh, architect, and contractor, we came to understand that we, as architects, are and will remain impotent uh, and politically irrelevant until we own the means and methods of construction. So we sat down and scratched our heads for a few minutes at the office and said, okay, so the, we know that this is going to be value engineered out of the project. If we were to build it, how would we build it? And so we realized that, again, we can't do it with plans and sections because even we wouldn't be able to uh, do this. But we realized that if we uh, uh, print out the plan of this thing and put it on the ceiling and then drop plumb bobs at every intersection, we could actually build seven rows of these kind of wood masonry blocks, a kind of log cabin, if you like, uh, per day. And we could do uh, 30 days of that, which means we could build it for about $30,000 and still make a little bit of a profit on it. Now, there's a huge gap between $30,000 and $200,000. So uh, either the uh, contractor was ignorant or knew exactly what he was doing or didn't know how to build this thing, but it was clear that this was not going to happen. So that was the first time in which we took over uh, a scope of work from a contractor and began to devel develop it on our own terms. And that has become a kind of systemic act that has been uh, occurring within the context of our studio, sometimes actually building things, other times beginning to envelop the managerial aspects of that scope uh, even down to the shop drawings within the context of our studio. Now, what was this structure? Essentially, the development of a detail, which is a kind of coining of masonry units as they intersect on a pivotal um, joint. Uh, the working drawings, as you see, with different colors so that we could screw and hang the pump plumb, bod, plumb bob. The actual geometry is a kind of faceted circle at the bottom and a star shape at the top, decentered, which effectively means that each of these slats of wood are identical in dimension uh, and such that the variables are only geometric, uh, but the unit of construction, like a masonry unit, is identical, uh, producing a, a joint that essentially shifts at each layer on the X, Y, and Z axis, the construction system a day's work uh, in the bottom left, uh, and effectively the construction of this with a little bit of profit by the end and the hookah den, there it was. Now what's interesting about this also is that it produces not only a structure but uh, what, what, what is called a surface active structural system. The star at the top acts as a compressive ring like on a, on a dome, but the undulation of that surface produces rigidity. The actual uh, um, joint is a s screw and glue joint. Uh, effectively, we calibrated the intersection of two uh, of, of two slats of wood, uh, put a, a, a dab of, wo uh, of glue in there, and then screwed it down and went to the next um, uh, and to the next layer. Um, and for us, a very transformative moment uh, in our career because it led to other projects like this, the Casa La Roca where, in fact, we analyze the bonding system of a running bond, a Flemish bond, and realize it has certain limitations. Through that, we realize that if you think of a bonding system not as a fixed system, but an, a movable or a variable system, you can slide bricks up to a certain yield point at which they don't intersect anymore and structurally fail. If we were to slide on that horizontal scale, you could go from a solid wall to a breathing wall uh, and go back to a solid wall 
And in doing that, transform what we know of as a great convention in the Jeffersonian serpentine walls of UVA or the church walls of Eladio Dieste, using the bonding system as an exact metric by which to fold brick. Folding them on the diagonal means that you require no uh, cutting of bricks, just like levers, on that diagonal, and then create on the verticals a more firm um, uh, anchor, bringing all of this together in a kind of corbelled surface. Uh, what is interesting for us here is not only is this a structural invention, but it's a way of integrating structure with daylighting and the kind of environmental seasoning of a space uh, within the context of the porch uh, at Casa La Roca. Sadly, this commission never happened, uh, and, uh, and uh, the project came to its death, the, the result of uh, familial problems and cheating and a love triangle and so forth. But, <laughs> you know, you have a luxury of doing uh, so many uh, you know, uh, amounts of work in your career, but that doesn't mean you like everything you do. At the end of the day, you like two or three things of the things that you do. And this, for me, was a kind of seminal moment because it, it, it argues for the possibility of an architecture that's highly figurative, sculptural, organic, but at the same time with the kind of Messian precision of a, a, of a very well-regulated system. Uh, it, it brings two modalities together that traditionally are not put together, uh, and, it, it, and it set the stage for a lot of other works that we did subsequently. One of them is the Tongxian Art Center, which effectively works with all sorts of alibis, all sorts of contingencies like program, uh, skylights, daylighting, uh, the, the, the slopes of roofs for drainage, and many things, but using the exact same slipped bonding system as a kind of packaging vessel for the very programs it wraps. That uh, volume you just saw is the exact register, the exact index of the staircase that ascends in the Tongxian Art Center to the second level. Now what's interesting about this, in fact, it's very different than the Venezuelan one, is that it adopts a Roman technique of construction. It uses the brick as a wide wall. This is in Beijing, so it's a seismic area. Building in brick is not necessarily stable there because of the, the, uh, the earthquakes. And so you, in reality, you have to build out of a different system that has tensile uh, abilities. So this is a framework, actually, a formwork for a concrete wall. The brick is used as a veneer up to about two, foot, two feet at a time, two, four, six, eight building up with rebar inside of it and pouring concrete. So this brick building, in fact, is a formwork for the concrete that's poured inside of it, and then using the perforation of the brick to, in, you know, to vent out the mechanical systems. This is the gatehouse that was built. You can see that the brick was even uh, put on the ceiling as the formwork for the concrete that is doing the, the real structural work on the northern elevation. We expose the concrete uh, crust, and the slippages of that brick are a way of compressing and expanding it, registering the tilt of the roof that is necessary for the drainage of water. All of this was a, a kind of test of that very same system that we inaugurated in Mantra. It is common to think of an architecture that is dedicated uh, to ground up building because we literally build from the ground up. But, and the ground is a stubborn thing. It is a rare occasion that we can do things with the ground. The auditorium or bleacher systems are that one occasion where the tilted plane gets to acquire a kind of figurative dimension. But grounds, more often than not, 99% are quite stable. So it is no accident that the ceiling, the sky, uh, 
has come historically to represent uh, the possibility of an alternative space. That alternative space um, has had great uh, figurative responses, but also ways in which uh, lighting, daylighting and all of that has been introduced. In the context of this project called uh, Catenary Clouds, we were to do an installation, a permanent installation in the lobby of a corporation uh, that involved the trajectory of three circulatory systems that needed to remain uncluttered on the ground so we knew that if we did anything we had to build upside down. So effectively we, we, we imagined what would it mean to register what's happening underneath without ever touching it. What would it mean to build a chandelier as a non-iconic piece, as a system, as a field condition? We were reminded uh, of the works of Gaudi that he in fact inverted to make arches, uh, but that the notion of the catenary as a figural and structural system, and what happens when catenaries begin to um, impact other catenaries as a system. We realized that hanging from two points, uh, we could uh, vary the height of a, of a catenary by hanging it down further, by widening its length, uh, by sistering two catenaries together and making them asymmetrical, or three-dimensionalizing that sistering process. And by doing that, uh, we effectively were able to develop a whole system that starts on one axis and torques and reorients itself in relationship to the adjoining wings uh, of circulation. In that doing, creating a kind of connection with the sky, albeit with the ephemeral uh, elements that have to do with uh, a system of what we thought to be beads, but then later on realized that we could do in the context of paper clips, what is a very conventional, almost banal instrument in, in the context of the corporation, and something that we could calibrate and build ourselves uh, without uh, any complexity. But the notion of building an architecture in suspense was uh, what was interesting for us. And it became uh, an intriguing and real uh, possibility <coughs> for the Georgia Tech School of Architecture, which involved the renovation of the Hinman Building, its restoration as a historic uh, heritage building, but then repurposing a crane that is now to be stuck in a certain position to become the suspension system for a new studio space aloft with no other structure than these tensile rods that hold it in place such that the floor can remain absolutely free of any columns uh, and that furniture can be moved around that this becomes a space for working for large installations of 40 feet high of um, the Beaux-Arts Ball of graduation of exhibitions and many other kinds of events. Um, this to me actually is an incredible project because it's incredibly strategic, uh, it's incredibly economical, it's only $170 a square foot, and is quite deliberate about its the tense relationship between uh, preservation, restoration culture on the one hand, uh, uh, stealth engineering on the other, encrypting a new authorship within the old, and then interventionary and radical imposition uh, on, on, on the third hand. Beyond looking at uh, tensile structures, uh, we have also looked at uh, nautical techniques of knots uh, from sailing, uh, and how to begin to uh, imagine a, an idea about suspension in the context of a tensegrity structure. This is a totally irrational installation that we did, um, first for the PS1 competition, later built at Sci Arc, where we said, well, what if we wanted rope to act in compression? Well, it can't. So only through the kind of 
impregnation of resin within the context of the dark members where we able to stiffen the rope to do exactly what it doesn't want to do, uh, so, such as we have seen in the Droch design, uh, inverting common logic, in, in, inverting expectation to produce uh, this elaborate web of joinery and knots bringing together a complex uh, web of systemic relationships of struts um, into uh, some kind of assembly in their main entry. The problem is that uh, tensegrity structures are the hardest things to build. They, there's no way to calculate them. You're constantly, every time you pull something, everything else moves with it. It's a kind of swarm logic. Uh, it, it, you don't have the same control of when you build sticks with infill, fra structural frames and infill. And, uh, well, the sci art piece was a total disaster, but that is part of the equation. But we got a, the opportunity to, to build a landscape in the context of a, uh, an urban design project in, in Washington, D.C., where we expanded that logic with uh, uh, a series of landscape features in the foreground of a building that then gets suspended aloft in that tensegrity that monumentalizes the thicket uh, and, uh, and becomes part of the groundscape uh, in the context of that block. Uh, and what I've always loved about tensegrities is because the tensile elements are so delicate, they effectively don't seem to exist. And seeing compressive struts magically floating in space has all be, always been somehow, um, uh, well, magical in, in, in my mind. Using uh, the empty rods as lighting instruments uh, at night and uh, uh, beginning to understand the system in its figures of possibilities. We were not interested in that shape. We were interested in showing them that we want your tensegrity to act as an arcade on the ground so it structures the experience of entry, uh, as you see on the right, but actually give you the freedom of creating the icon or the symbol that you want, what you're seeing uh, on the left. And so that uh, is really the same installation as this, but with the struts uh, distributed in a different relationship uh, according to how you pull the tensile elements in space. Again, not yet built. But in that process, we got uh, the commission, and this time real, to build uh, a permanent urban design installation for the Guangzhou Biennale a couple years ago. And looking at the history of bamboo, we realized, well, what would it mean to build uh, something like that installation in the context of the, where the old stone walls of Guangzhou were, penetra penetrating the ground on very surgical places where the infrastructure under, underneath the ground is not, and begin to enliven that ground uh, according to the logic, again, of tensegrity. And so we developed uh, an installation, we did a, a working drawing set that was this thick, and we gave it, we handed it over to them on like, you know, May 2nd, uh, about a week earlier than they had uh, asked for it. And they called us back and they said, we love it. Uh, do you mind uh, if we get rid of all of the tensile elements and we just make compressive elements throughout it? And, you know, it, uh, consistent with the kind of ironies that we've experienced in building in China and, and uh, other uh, offshore places, we, we didn't know how to interpret it. I mean, uh, that effectively was the, 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 the death uh, uh, of the project. Uh, had you been structural engineers, you'd be laughing now. Um, but anyway, we realized that they're, they're, um, they're serious. They want to build this out of compre compressive struts. We said, okay, we have a week. Uh, we're going to do this for you. We are going to change it to all compressive struts, but we have to change the shape. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, work with almost the same footprint, but we'll idealize the outside. 
we will still frame the two trees that are in there. We'll also create an oculus to use less material. And that will be the shape, the figure of what we're going to build you. We will also still touch the ground in the least possible spot so that we do not dis uh, disturb any of the sewer system, any of the wiring and all of that. So there'll be an acupunctural relationship to the ground. But most importantly, what we're going to do is design the formwork for the steel struts. We found, uh, we were working with a, a door manufacturer of the time, and each of these steel struts are in fact uh, recycled uh, uh, door handles. And we said to them, what we're going to do is we're going to design the density of steel that you need to build this and the formwork, and that's it. Then you just build it. So none of the geographic or metric locations of any of these uh, uh, struts were determined by us. We only determined density and relative orientation. And the idea of understanding density means that you understand that certain forces are compressive on this axis. There's a certain moment at that uh, moment where you, you're connecting the vertical and the horizontal and that acquires or needs a certain lightness uh, as it spans across. And the rule was that every strut needs to be welded in at least with two other members so that the principle of triangulation will always make certain a certain lateral stability. And then we gave them to the direction to build it up and shake it. If it shook, then add another strut, weld it, and then shake it again. <laughs> Which they did better than we could have ever told them to do. Um, the contractor for this was, in fact, uh, the person with whom we had built and designed many door handles. So this is a contractor who does, uh, who's an expert in metals and locks and, uh, and locksmiths, but has never built architecture as such. So the kind of parametric instructions that he was given was perfect for him because he could then interpret uh, in a kind of low culture fashion all of the things that we had, we had uh, calculated, if you like, digitally. Uh, it's urban performance then is really to begin to crown a, a, a very important but casual, if you like, commercial corner on the left. Uh, creating a kind of ephemeral presence between the trees and the traffic uh, and effectively lightening itself up in relationship to the oculus. Now, the argument here, of course, is that some of the installations I've shown you uh, are really about the conceptualization and the development of architecture through tectonics. Uh, the nest shows that very well because each bead of grass or hay and all of that uh, becomes part of its expression. But let's not forget that the bowl on the left is really conceptually the other side of the same coin. Um, concrete uh, and other poured uh, uh, elements are also composed of aggregates, even when you polish and smooth them out such that they're invisible. But the, the, the notion of figuration and configuration somehow go hand in hand, although the rhetoric of their expression is altogether different. I'm very much invested, of course, in uh, properties of configuration because, in a way, understanding and developing systems liberates you from the a priori and uh, what you have conceived to be the right form for architecture. Uh, it, it is at this time that we were um, shortlisted for a very important competition at the American University in Beirut against uh, a team of other young architects with one who was not so young uh, and not so unknown, in fact, an alumna of that school and, a, and an architect of global stature. We were so convinced that this project politically was designed for her that we didn't have to compete. We simply could do the project that we wanted to do, knowing fully well that the commission was hers, and this gave us the freedom to do exactly our intellectual project the way we should do it. At the same time, I had discovered the Ito's uh, Todd's um, store in, uh, in Tokyo, 
and uh, was absolutely enlightened by the notion of a building whose expression uh, is an organic structural form that speaks to the very uh, trees in the foreground. Uh, I was, of course, alongside all of you, let down when I went inside and realized that, in fact, uh, what I had expected to be the spectacular structural system is purely a skin on the outside and does not have any spatial or formal uh, repercussions on the interior. That building effectively is playing a game not dissimilar from the theories already imparted by Venturi many, many years earlier between the dock and the decorated shed. So we thought this to be an opportunity to develop a structure whose site is in this uh, Bosco not speak to the buildings of the campus nor its quad, but actually to the to the to the foliage, to the uh, to the trees. There's a, a row of palm, uh, uh, cypress, uh, ficus. That extrapolating from the logic uh, of that uh, natural architecture, we already knew a priori that we wanted our building to dissolve in the trees. The question was, how do we invent a system that Ito did not? In effect, our agenda was to complete Ito's building in a way that he had not, in a, as a corrective measure. It's a little bit um, pedantic in that sense, but it was an important part of what we were trying to do. So, how did we do that? First, we developed a geometry between the hexagon and the triangle. Once truncated, the hexagon becomes a triangle uh, to create a column. Uh, a column, uh, once expanded, becomes a pilotee on the same geometry. Or once rotated, can transfer uh, uh, structure from one, one axis to the other or become a simple wall. Knowing that this structure that we're building is a, 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 a building in the round, uh, we could not stack the program logically on top of itself. So we also realized that uh, we had to make a structure that's solid and, if you like, spatial or carved out at the bottom, that somewhere in the middle uh, loads would have to be transferred, and obviously at the top it would be lightened up and therefore be able to operate much more like a tree. So we were able, from one column, to spatialize the system. Now, looking more concretely at the very building and the program that we had to operate on, we also had to rationalize it within a building system that could be graspable, uh, almost tenable by the very people building it. So we imagined the domino frame and the, uh, the transformations it undergoes when it has large spaces underneath with transfer beams. Uh, we understood that because of the trees on the western edge, their roots needed to survive so that the cantilever would have to operate or the theater would require raked seating and would necessi necessarily uh, transform the structure and it would all get li uh, lightened. All of this meant that here's an opportunity to do a building whose structure, whose skin, whose floor plans, floor slabs are structural diaphragms, whose program and circulation operate in absolute tandem with each other to produce a kind of synergy that brings together the synthesis uh, of that building. Now in relation to this, we also uh, were working on other structural models, uh, other structural models which had to do with not three-dimensional structural systems, but two-and-a-half-dimensional structural systems, effectively coffering. This is an installation that we did for the uh, Boston ICA uh, based on a simple two-way slab. The difference was that this two-way slab worked on the principle of a Voronoi pattern. The reason was because we wanted the Voronoi to inform different configurations that it had to adapt itself to, to become uh, a wall uh, on one side, to be flat on the floor on one other axis, to make a dome that's three-dimensional on uh, one end, or to make an archway on the other. We needed to develop a system that could readapt itself to any condition 
that it was um, uh, subjected. What you don't see here is uh, the innocence of people who don't understand structure. Uh, this structure obviously collapsed. Uh, you m no, with the projection, you can't see it, but on my screen, you can see all of the tensile rods that are holding the vault up in space for the simple reason that coffering is very strong on this axis, but if you bring it down to the ground like this, it's basically like an accordion. And so, um, well, in the darkness of that gunnery, it was... Uh, 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 not quite visible, uh, the suspension system we put in there, but we realized to do this right, we have to do it again. So we got another installation in China, and for that opportunity, we realized we now need to investigate both the compressive and tensile elements of that same installation in a figure eight, creating a dome on one side and a dish on the other side, and then rectify what had gone wrong. And how do we do that? We had to invent a redistribution of that coffering system such that the keystone that would normally be up there gets uh, displaced to the bottom, meaning that the loads that are coming down here do not come into the ground like this, but they keep getting transferred to the center as they go down and, are, uh, uh, and resist the kind of compression that uh, uh, that uh, resulted in the failure of the former. We, we thought that this would work, uh, and in fact we built it, and uh, it seemed to work when we uh, built it, but more importantly, uh, it, it worked even better when we climbed on top of it, uh, and we knew that something uh, was done right. Um, this, in fact, uh, is an instance where we did an installation after a competition that we had lost, excuse me, won but had not been built in, uh, in, uh, in Kuwait. I'll speak to that a little bit later. But suffice it to say that the notion of working with a repetitive unit uh, in different configurations, this being a collaboration with uh, Adam Silverman, uh, an installation that migrated from L.A. Mocha to uh, the Nasher Museum, it was just bought by the Nasher, uh, a, a repetitive ceramic system uh, that uh, in a way is distributed in a gradient form uh, around the field condition of the floor uh, is really the same kind of system that was thought through in the context of the Kuwait uh, Convention Center that is built up of an arena, uh, many auditoria, housing above, uh, a marketplace, a mall below, and a sports arena, all of which was designed more around the idea of a parametric unit that starts from a triangle, goes to uh, a square, uh, the structural unit that is, to a pentagon, uh, a hexagon, a circle, and so forth. The notion was that if a coffer is able to transform over space and time, it is able to adapt itself to the shifting geometries of typologies below. And as such, one could begin to imagine that the circle, the hexagon, and all of those adapt themselves uh, in local relationships to the very programs that they are asked to correspond to below, the structural pylons, the store uh, storefronts in the souks, the auditoria that require triangulation, and the arena that is circular. All of this bringing together a kind of smart system. Now, this smart system uh, is two and a half, dim uh, on the uh, uh, two and a half dimensional uh, axis, but what was interesting to us is to try to now translate the tectonic unit into three dimensions. When we think of the world, and when we think of the natural systems, we are not so shocked that we understand water to be the same thing as snow, uh, or ice, or steam, but in a state of change. But when we build, we build with static units, uh, bricks, uh, slats of wood, logs, 
sheets of glass. What would it mean to invent a tectonic unit that is in fact exactly the same thing but variable on the x, y, and z axis as these four units demonstrate each other to be? Uh, they are simply the same thing with certain parametric shifts such that you can go from a box beam on the right to a kind of vector active uh, expanded system on the left. That enables the ability to transform that very unit from a two-pronged system on the right to a four-pronged system on the left, an eight-pronged system, and then transform effectively uh, from a structural condition that is a, uh, a stacked uh, bench system here, uh, a laterally braced, uh, almost Casa La Roca wall here, a truss that spans 30, 40 feet here, and finally a cantilever that uh, extends another 10 feet on the opposite end. Uh, this was a real exploration, a structural exploration, a, a spatial exploration to see what can this parametric unit do as it begins to uh, craft itself around its site. Much like the GSD project, it had a site that it had to navigate around with a simple box beam which had a, a kind of rotational symmetry with rivet, uh, rivets that um, uh, uh, effectively worked around the column, uh, spanned 40 feet, and effectively what you're looking at right now is the stacked system of six bays on the vertical axis here, rotating individually uh, to, to reach the beam over my head on the horizontal axis, uh, and the bubbles effectively are an index of that systemic rotation uh, using the, um, uh, the, the, the beam, the box beam, effect effectively separated and unwound uh, to the cantilever on the opposite end. Um, that was an important project for us because we realized then that uh, once we built it, we actually built it with form work and even measured with a, a ruler how much, once the form work was, uh, was released, how much it would slump, and it literally only slumped about an inch and a half or so. But the notion of, uh, of building from top down is something that... Uh, has not only occurred at Georgia Tech or in Villa Moda in Ku Kuwait, but in, a, in probably our most famous uh, project. If, if, if very much a one-liner, I'm not very impressed by this project, but it is the one project I can boast has been effectively copied most around the world, in Vietnam, in Australia, in Brazil, in China. I mean, it's kind of incredible how the internet has enabled the speed of replication and uh, distribution uh, in, in extraordinary ways. I say this without any qualms about the authorship of this because uh, we ourselves developed this building, this uh, structural system, as a kind of challenge to Victor Lundy. Uh, Victor Lundy was this is a very unknown architect from the 1950s who happened to do some very extraordinary projects before he kind of fell into a completely different line of work by the 70s and 80s. But I happened to meet him in the context of um, um, the out-of-the-box symposium at Harvard and realized that this is a figure who had effectively done all of the projects that we'd done but 30 years earlier we happen not to have known about them. And so this was, in a way, a completion of that repertoire for us. What it was was the development of a system of slats that, in perspective, on axis, would produce the illusion of continuity. The ceiling needed to house all of the uh, sprinkler systems, lighting systems, mechanical systems, and so forth. And uh, the continuity of these slats of wood became a vehicle by which to give figure and body to all of the program that was overhead, and then touch the ground in the least amount of spaces uh, so that the tables of the restaurant could be reconfigured, but effect is a theatrical uh, proscenium, much like what we witness here,
that people can come in and out of the lateral. You see the wine room, you see the program leaking out of those cracks. Uh, but effectively, uh, working with a, a very uh, um, economical plywood system to laminate an architecture. Even the floor and the, the tables are a kind of bamboo that are doing the same thing. Uh, I've argued here that uh, materials are central to the way in which we operate. And the graining of plywood has a certain efficacy, but the graining of all materials uh, has a, a, a kind of central function in the way that they operate. Here, for the Western House, we realize that corrugation is very malleable uh, on the uh, horizontal axis, but very structurally firm on the vertical axis. And we could create, uh, produce uh, space within the context of the skin by delaminating that cor uh, corrugation in order to insert a stair that connects the living room to the garden uh, on this existing building and using the cladding as a mechanism uh, to hide or conceal the relationship between the old and the new. Now what was important in this also was the recognition that in architecture you don't draw as a pictorial act. Uh, in architecture drawing is an act of construction already. The fact that we know that the line at the top is exactly the same length as the undulating line at the bottom is already the proof that this is a developable surface, a ruled surface, and therefore fabricatable. fabricatable. And once we understand that, then the language, the syntax, and the uh, the, all of the elements within the corrugation come together, that it, it can have a structural function, a spatial function on the left, it turns the corner with another mechanism, it can get perforated for light, or it can get uh, ripped open for a window system. Uh, recognizing the, the nature of sheet material in American construction industry is maybe the central thing that we have to come to grips with. Here in the New England house, recognizing that rubber, uh, plywood, uh, copper are all sheet material and the registration of that thinness, the systemic veneers that go up uh, this building uh, in this promenade that extends all the way up from the family room to the living room is a central part of the discovery uh, of not only the spatial conditions of that uh, building but it's um, its construction system. To the degree that we can, we use the logics and rules of regulation of each tectonic system to inform how we operate. So for instance, when we are working with a shiplap system of cladding and we need light, we don't just add a window there. We go into the reveal between the shiplap and use the score as a way to create the horizontal slats that brings light to the library, for instance. But at the same time, we also know when to break the rules. So the laceration that you see on the side of this building is also a kind of elusive symbol that registers the ramp stair that connects the public level on the second to the third floor. All the while, recognizing that there's a stubborn and deliberate refusal to add attributes and hardware to this kind of architecture. To the degree that we can, we refuse to engage the construction industry, uh, and in this case, of course, using the board and batten system, delaminate it to produce the um, uh, door handles for the garages. It's important to construct rules. It's maybe the hardest and the most important uh, to break them also. Cladding uh, is an important aspect of architecture because it is a rare occasion where you are able to, in fact, embody all of the architectural necessities in structure alone. You don't always get to do uh, uh, untempered pavilions that are in the outdoors. So the skin has its own vitality. And in the case for this uh, 
uh, building for a, a corporate headquarters in in Korea for a uh, fashion design uh, studio, we realized that uh, a, a kind of rediscovery of their main techniques of pleating could become a, a, a clear instrument to develop a skin that shields the sun on the south, uh, produces deep fins on the west and the east against the extreme light of the afternoons and flushes out uh, on the north. Really using the skin as a environmental device uh, uh, to perforate, uh, give density and lightness to this system while also giving a kind of structural rigidity uh, to the skin on its own terms. But the pleating, we realize, much like an accordion, can expand and contract also uh, to produce an unfolding of the corner to bring in light in the side alleyway that, that connects uh, to the back alley, an important public space for that building. Uh, the tectonic systems that we illustrated uh, in Casa La Roca in the context of a massive block can also be reinterpreted as a thin sheathing for uh, the Thunder Stadium. Here, perforated metal becomes a skin system by which this cladding of this huge stadium uh, can engage alternative programs like uh, restaurants, um, uh, bars, uh, hotels, atria, uh, giving a kind of index to the program that is happening uh, in this unorthodox and, uh, and hybridized uh, arena for St. Paul. Uh, working a shingled system instead of a, um, uh, a masonry system to navigate the X, Y, and Z coordinates to begin to build up this icon in relationship to the highway, the plazas, and the urban spaces that revitalize downtown St. Paul. The building as a kind of uh, index of the very programs uh, it contains. So with this, I, I try to represent the, the, the emphatic way in which we've toggled back and forth between uh, contingencies and constraints of a higher order uh, with urban design uh, constraints, codes, uh, fire suppression systems, and at the same time cert a certain lightness uh, and levity in the furniture and the installations that we do that are so central uh, to the explorations that we undertake. In this last project, uh, we undertook, uh, as with many other projects, I should say, uh, a collaboration, in this case, with uh, Gediminas Urbonas, uh, an artist uh, in the Art, Culture, Technology Discipline Group at MIT to celebrate the 150-year uh, anniversary of MIT in a collaborative installation on the Charles River. He was very much uh, interested in the legacy of CAVS, uh, the Center for Advanced uh, Vis Visual uh, Art at MIT, uh, and uh, the, the role of uh, Georgi Kepesh in the context of that, and he wanted uh, whatever we do together to become a, an archive, a visual archive uh, of all of the thought and the work that he did on the Charles River. I, on the other hand, wanted to develop a vessel, uh, a, a shelf or a screen uh, for him to exhibit that work on. And so uh, the, our collaborative work was a, a work of indexing and archiving on the one hand and the materialization and the, the making physical of a projection that could uh, link MIT back to Boston through the waterfront and through all of the different uh, ways in which uh, that can be registered. So we knew that it had to be very cost effective. It's an installation that's gonna be up effectively only for two days. Uh, and we realized that the drive-in screen uh, was what we needed to do. Simply the projection through, through light, we develop uh, the presence of this archive. It had to be light though, uh, not just be projected with light, so we realized that what if we made it out of a pneumatic structure and held it down in place? Again, it's air, completely no substance, just a fabric that holds air. 
We wanted whatever it ends up being to speak to the skyline. Uh, of course, that's New York on the left, but the skyline of Boston. We knew that the figure of what we were working with should somehow find its voice in relationship to the view beyond. But more importantly, we wanted it to engage with the, the Memorial Drive walk to urbanize it, uh, to engage it with uh, the very public that is going to be walking along the Charles River as this uh, entire edge of the campus becomes closed down for the entire weekend, to make it an urban artifact. And finally, we also understood that this needs to be an elusive symbol, legible from some perspectives as an icon for MIT, but also uh, quite illegible and abstract from other points of view. And so uh, there emerged a kind of inflatable icon in the figure of MIT, uh, albeit in, the, um, in, in its first manifestation slightly overweight. Uh, and not the proportion we had desired, but effectively as we developed it, uh, quite an impressive uh, uh, element, and you can see its uh, colossal monumentality in the context of the construction yard, was in, at the end quite small in the context of, um, of the skyline, uh, but again, through patterning systems and all of that, it acquired uh, a certain presence in relationship to, uh, to the Prudential Building, the Hancock Building, and a vessel by which uh, we could gauge those projections uh, in, from the sketchbooks uh, of, of Kepesh. Here, uh, architecture, projection, media, uh, all come to coalesce with each other in, a, uh, in, in blurred boundaries uh, that, uh, that work and index really effectively the different uh, modalities of thinking between myself and my team with uh, uh, Gediminas and his uh, to, to build up uh, this uh, uh, thing that effectively uh, was there for a very uh, temporary period. Uh, with that, uh, I simply say that uh, one of the key things that um, uh, I've tried to do uh, is really to bring these two modalities of thinking together. On the one hand, what has interested me uh, a great deal uh, is uh, the history of classicism, uh, a kind of organic architecture that is interested in the relationship to, uh, of part to whole. Uh, the classical language always somehow grapples with that. Uh, but on the other hand, also a, a completely different uh, legacy of architectural exploration that is more associable with the speculations and experimentations of the Gaudis, the Diestes, um, even the Garys, if you like, uh, from the structural experiments to the expressionist experiments, which are uh, in a way much more uh, open-ended. Uh, but these two modalities have rarely been brought together by uh, uh, architects. Uh, a lot of uh, our work is trying to bring into synthesis the seeming contradictions uh, of these two cultures by way of these uh, explorations. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah.
Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Look at this. Is I know. It totally is. I mean, is there anything like this in this town? Would anybody do?